We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall, and welcome to The Meaningful Life. One of my favorite sayings is, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. Despite our best efforts, life doesn't unfold like we expect. Boo-hoo! And we have to improvise as we go along. My witness today is Pippa Evans, who teaches improvisation and has spent the last 15 years improvising all over the world and is a core member of the Olivia award-winning showstopper, The Improvised Musical. And she regularly pops up on Radio 4 programmes like The Now Show, I'm Sorry I Haven't a Clue and Just a Minute. She's also written a new book called Improv Your Life, an improviser's guide to embracing whatever life throws at you. Welcome to the podcast, Pippa. Now, if you had a manifesto, it is that you would want every child to have a chance to study improvisation before the age of 10 until they leave school. So why this huge ambition? Well, what a great opening question. (laughs) Start with your manifesto. So I've witnessed quite a lot of young people through teaching workshops, through being in schools, I've watched the joy be drained out of them once they go into the high school system. And part of that is losing their childlike joy and going into, I must be a grown up. And, and, and I believe being part of being a grown up is holding on to some of that joy so that we can actually playfully find our way through life. And they take everything very literally, because I've also been into schools and I will have a box of things that would be prompts for stories. And my dog used to have a bone that was half chewed and it would be put in there. And when they were in primary school, they would say, it's a telescope that a dog can look through and see the future. And you think, wow, what a wonderful idea. You take them into children who are over 11 years old and they say, oh, we've found a dead body in the garden. And suddenly you're in soap opera rather than sort of magic realism. And that is really rather sad. Well, yeah, there's something about having to be very serious when you're a teenager. And, you know, I remember it myself as well, you know, wanted to be involved in the drama, exactly like you say, a a soap opera. If there's drama, then I must be a grown-up. Because I believe that the 12-year-olds and 13-year-olds also see that it could be a telescope for a dog to look into the future, but they don't say it out loud for fear of what might occur. And Uh. so what what improvisation really is a training in is trusting your instinct, or what I like to call following your obvious, and being brave that someone else in the room will go, actually, that's actually what I saw. And by you stepping forward, you're allowing other people to step forward into that. So it would be why it would be really important, I think, for high school kids to be learning improvisation is because it teaches co-creation and it teaches stepping forward. So to be able to teach those two things in tension with each other, you know, we kind of feel like I must always be the star of the show. What about we actually teach at moments, you're going to be the star of the show. And at moments, you're going to support the rest of the show. But you're always in the show. So that you're never not part of what is happening. But you're not always going to have the spotlight on you. And that is a gift and a wonderful thing to be able to support someone else's moment rather than see that moment as taking something away from you. And actually, by all working together, the moment is actually more magical than if you take charge. Oh, absolutely. The the sort of emergent third, if you like, the thing that comes out that you didn't even know was going to happen. So when we're doing scene work, and this is, again, a thing that I love teaching people who are not performers improvisation so much, is this realisation moment where you go, oh, I, I was going to come on stage and say that I was a a teacher. And then someone else came on the stage and said, hello, policeman. And in that moment, you have to become the policeman. And then suddenly you're doing something that you didn't even know you could or would or should do. And it becomes uh, something other that you both own a bit of together. In a sort of previous life, I was sent to Australia. I wasn't sent there as, as a part convict. of the penal code, <laughs> as a convict, although I do have relatives that were sent to Australia for stealing sheep. Wow. Or in fact, actually, if we're going to be really accurate, receiving stolen sheep, which of course is not quite so bad. Which does sound like the beginning of an improv show, Andrew, if I'm honest. <laughs> 
Anyway, I was there looking at how to create breakfast shows. And at that period, breakfast shows were what they called zoo form, zoo formats, where they would have lots of characters in it. And I was told the two secrets of improvisation. And bizarrely enough, I actually still use those two secrets sometimes in my counselling room when I'm teaching things to my clients. And the two rules I was given, the first one was don't block. Mm -hmm. And the second one was don't wimp. And this is incredibly useful for negotiation between partners. So if the two of you are having a dispute about should your daughter go off to a, a festival, even though she's 16 sort of kind of thing. So you can see that the two sides of the argument might be. And the idea is you don't block your partner's opinion, because if you do that, they just start defending it. And if you sort of wimp out, you're not going to have anything in the way of negotiation. So I found that some of those improvisation skills are actually incredibly useful in marriage. And I think what you're saying of this idea of co-creation is really interesting. Yeah, it's re it's absolutely right. So don't block and don't wimp is exactly that. Don't ignore what is being said. Don't deny what the truth of someone else on the stage. But also don't remove yourself from the conversation. Or in another improv way of putting that is accept and build, accept and build. And so you have to accept what your partner has said, as in agree that that has been said and it is in the room rather than accept what it is they want necessarily. And then build from there so that well, your response is at least acknowledging that what has been said has been said rather than that's not true. You know, I, I refuse to acknowledge your opinion. So accept and build is a really, really important thing, which is often translated as yes and in improvisation and is a, is a wonderful training tool. Uh, it is quite complicated because there is a sense that you have to agree with everything, which is why I prefer accept and build because it's not so that the yes is the acceptance and the and is the building. So I think we must begin to look at yes and because bizarrely enough, that's something I use a huge amount in my room as well. My best known book is called I Love You, But I'm Not In Love With You. And the problem with the but is what does it do to the sentence? I love you, but I'm not in love with you. Which part becomes the most important? Well, exactly. So then the end of it becomes more important and denies the beginning. Yeah. So it becomes I don't love you anymore. Yeah. So you're saying yes, but you're actually denying their truth. But yes, and says, yes, I love you. And I'm not in love with you. So both of them are actually equally important, which is in fact, often where we are, we're dealing with two difficult ideas at the same time. So yes, and is a really interesting thing. I've actually had people who've tried, I've made them argue. And every time they have to say yes, and, and it's a, a little artificial, but it becomes an entirely different argument. If you take out, you're not allowed to use the word but, you can only use the word and, and it makes a huge difference. H how have you found yes and works in the, the workshops that you give? Well, yeah, exactly as you say, because what it does is you accept what has happened and then you build on it. So you are not blocking and you are not wimping because you have to put something in yourself. We all experience yes people and we maybe we've been them ourselves where someone presents an idea and we simply cheerlead them yeah that's a great idea but maybe a bit of us is hesitant to put something of ourselves in there because then we'd be a part of it uh, because actually therefore if we don't put a bit of ourselves in it we can always deny that we were ever part of that thing should it go wrong so there's a bit of safety <laughs> in cheerleading actually it's going oh well yeah no Andrew had a great idea for a thing but uh, and you know and I really tried to help him uh, but it didn't work out whereas what I often find is people bring buts in too soon. That is why the problem with the but as well is that yes and is a building and a creation tool. So if we say, let's build a house, you say, yes, and it's going to have a big chimney. Yes, and it's going to have an amazing roof. Yes, and it's going to have a roof terrace. Yes, and we'll invite our friends. Yes, and we'll have a party. Yes, and we'll uh, have all the neighbours come around. Yes, and we'll put a big gazebo out. Yes, and we'll have a barbecue, et cetera, et cetera. It can grow and it grows and it grows. Yes, and is infinite. It shows that there is always another possibility, which is one of the things I love about improvisation is it's about constantly looking for the potential and knowing that there is always another way. What often happens before I've even explained the exercise is you say, let's build a house. And the first person says, yes, but I don't have any money. 
because they want to protect themselves. So they bring in the, the truth, uh. the reality. Well, I don't know what will happen if I yes and this moment because there is potential and I don't know if I'm going to be able to handle what happens next. So I'm going to bring in the block. So these two things I just want to re-lift up, and I, I love this idea, accept and build. So yes, and is accept and build. And it's okay to bring the butts in, but they've got to come in way down the line. Let's actually get, let's get all the ideas together, and then we can suddenly start putting the butts in. So don't go to butts too soon. Absolutely. So what often happens when I'm teaching in business environments, work environments, is people say, well, no one ever listens to my idea, you know, because they say, I've got this great idea for a new product, let's say, if that's what, and the finance team will say, yeah, but we don't have the finances for it. And the person hasn't even said what the idea is yet, you know, so, so this person has already now doesn't feel like they can bring their ideas because they get shut down so quickly. Whereas actually what would be better is to listen to the full idea and then say, wow, I love this idea of lemon chicken nuggets, let's say. Uh, but we, mm. Um, mm, delicious. But we don't have the money at this moment. However, we're going to put it on the shelf. We're going to keep that as an idea for when we do have the development money, which means the full idea has been heard rather than we've shut them down at the point of I have an idea. You know? And if this is your partner, you might think this is a terrible idea. Um, let's stay with your chicken McNuggets yeah. for supper. But if you actually stay with it for a while, you might actually find another option that would be acceptable to both of you. So you don't actually fancy chicken McNuggets, but you don't shoot down the chicken McNuggets. <laughs> you know, you say, and actually, we could have a salad with that. And if you stay in the grey zone or you even accept something you really don't like the idea of, yes, I can see that, rather than shoot it down, you can actually then, the two of you, it can be a gateway through to something else. So you might decide instead of chicken McNuggets, you're going to have chicken soup, for example. You might actually get somewhere with it. I don't think that the Nuggets example is working particularly well, but don't <laughs> knock down your partner's ideas. Stay with them and see, even if you don't like it, it could get you to something that would be acceptable to both of you. But I see all the time people closing each other down right at the very beginning of a negotiation. And I think part of that is knowing yourself, you know, know thyself is such an important thing, because I know that sometimes when my partner says, let's do this, I immediately go, no, I know that there's something that just makes me want to say no. And it probably is a slight fear that, well, I don't know what that is. I don't know if I can cook it or whatever it is, if we're carrying on with the chicken McNuggets. And so I just am aware that that's a reaction. So I actually can catch it before the no comes out of my mouth and have a moment to allow the idea to breathe so I can check, oh, do I really not like this idea or am I just annoyed because... I was going to come up with the idea for whatever this thing is, you know. So being able to know yourself, to be able to breathe through moments where we are reacting rather than responding. I think that's a really big difference that, again, in improvisation, we have to check in because we come on stage and we make an offer. That's the language we use. I make an offer or I think I'm going to make an offer and the other performer makes the offer first. There's a bit of me that feels thrown off kilter because what happened isn't what I thought would happen. However, in that moment, what has happened is what is happening. So I must get rid of what I thought would happen. And that's a very, very specific and very simple and yet incredibly hard to master concept, being able to be in the moment and stop being in the moment you thought would be the moment. Mm, that is very profound. Be in the moment that is rather than the one you imagined coming along. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that happens a lot. And I, you know, again, I speak always as the improviser who is ever striving for impossible perfection, you know, so I, I will never master these things myself completely. But as long as I have the language that I can go, oh, I see what's happening. I'm currently living in the moment that I thought would be rather than the one that is. I can uh, try and ground myself and return to the moment that is. Well, already my planning for this programme has gone completely out the window. <laughs> so I was actually trying to 
get us to actually do an improvisation so that we could show people what improvisation is. And I think we've given a lot of material away about it, but I think it would still be useful for us to play a game together to actually show what happened. So let's play a game. Well, yeah, and I think this game will illustrate actually what I just said because it's impossible for it not to happen. So what we're going to do is we're going to do one word at a time aphorisms or what I like to call fridge magnets. So the things that you would buy in a shop and stick on your fridge to inspire you in the morning. So we'll speak one word at a time. So let's just do a little practice of that. If we were to introduce ourselves, we'd say, hello. My name is Harry Folds. Great. So that's uh, <laughs> Harry Folds exists now. <laughs> Great. Does he? Uh, so, so that's exa- exactly how it goes. One word at a time. But when we believe that we've found the end of the aphorism, we will both go, Hmm, like two very wise people have just said something very wise, okay? Right. So, um, sunshine is bright and can always lift you up. Ah. Oh. Mm, very nice, very nice. Let's do another one. Okay, shall I start this yeah. time? Don't worry about anything that isn't happening now. Oh, so what I love also is how the response at the end even responds to how you feel about the aphorism. So that for me was like, oh, yes. Yeah, that's exactly what we were just talking about. And then now I would love to just talk to you about your process in that moment in terms of intellectualizing, thinking. When was a word that you weren't expecting anything that came up for you? You're asking me to put a third layer on. I, so I'm trying to play the game. I'm thinking about how the program is going mm. and what I need to be doing there. I was sort of in the moment. So I wasn't really thinking too much about that. It was almost like you were asking me to have a third thought at the same time that I don't think I'm able to have. Yeah, great. That's wonderful that you were that in the moment. Sometimes when we play these games, what comes up for people is literally, I was expecting this word. I had to struggle to find another word. So you can watch people go into the moment they were imagining and then return into the moment that is. Sometimes we get really long pauses as people try to think of the best word because there's a pressure. We haven't got into the brain space of co-creation. We're still in the space of I must do the best thing ever and people must be impressed by my one word, which is so crazy, isn't it? There's only so much we can control, which is that one word. So we put all this pressure on that one word rather than go, oh, I'm going to really listen to what that other person said so that my word almost comes out organically because I'm just responding in the moment to what is happening. And how do you think this works in an argument? Because an argument is not something you co-create together, but you actually have got something you want to say I'm sort of half thinking it's probably better to be in the moment rather than in your head. I don't know. Does this work for arguments, do you think? Well, I'm going to tell you two things. One is sometimes the misunderstanding of improvisation is it should be super fast always. And that game might not be the best illustration for an argument scenario. So for me, for the argument, the biggest thing is the pause because we're often triggered in arguments. So if we need to have a moment where we breathe before we respond because otherwise we are reacting. So even just to take a breath can feel like half an hour in an argument, you know, if it's a heated argument I'm talking about. Hmm. So to have the moment to breathe, let the offer land. If we ever come to a Pippa Evers workshop, I constantly hit my chest because I'm going, let the offer land, let it land. Because so often someone starts talking and you don't let the rest of the sentence land because they've already said to go for a classic, you never wash up the dishes. And I've already started screaming before it's landed and I've allowed it to go. Is there a bit of truth in that? Can I agree? Can I yes and that moment? Yes, I don't wash up the dishes. However, it's because I'm earning the money, damn it. (laughs) (laughs) That is really good advice for an argument. Let the insult land. Don't chop it off halfway through because it actually might be a different insult from the one you were expecting. And then actually give yourself a chance to sort of react from the punch almost. And so that you are actually really responding to what's actually been said rather than what you imagine has been said. And maybe your second thought is going to be better than your first thought. Yes. And also you're allowing your partner to see the impact they're having on you. Mm. So actually, if someone says to you, I hate you so much right now, and we immediately go, well, I hate you too. We haven't actually allowed that. What does that mean in that moment? 
you know, we say so many things in arguments we don't mean. And when we see that, and I remember it from childhood, you know, when I would say something horrible to my mum and she would, and I would wound her. And then you immediately as a child would be like, oh, I want to take it back. I, I, I didn't mean it. I love you so much. You're my most special person. So to allow someone to see, you know, and it's a vulnerable thing. I'm going to let you see how painful that was for me to hear. And I, I'm going to respond, you know, however I respond, but at least I know I'm responding rather than reacting. You seem like the most natural improviser in the world, but <laughs> tell me your journey with it. Oh, well, so in terms of how I got into it, I was constantly being pulled in lots of different directions. I want to be a stand-up comedian. I also really love working with people. I love teaching. I love musical theatre. I'm basically a bit of a magpie. Like I really am attracted to things and I'm excited by the world. But I found myself at one point just getting incredibly anxious. That anxiety was really bad. And I think anxiety is one of the worst things to explain because it sounds kind of nothing. It's hard to explain the impact that it has because it is this inner feeling that you just like you're vibrating on the inside and you'll constantly feel like you're making a bad choice. Yeah, there isn't the right choice. So you're kind of always making half choices. Oh, should I do that? Should I do that? So you're always in the should rather than in the I am. And it got to a point where I had to just stop doing anything. So I stopped gigging. I stopped doing any performing. Basically, I stopped doing stuff <laughs> and uh, had to take a break. And I was lucky enough that I was able to do that, actually. The only thing I couldn't stop doing was I was teaching a workshop for women in the justice system in improvisation at the time. And so I couldn't not do that workshop because it would be letting down some vulnerable women. And I found that by doing this workshop, I was there going, oh my God, I realize I need this workshop. Like more than <laughs> these women need this workshop right now, because it was for me, it was, I had to show up. I had to be in the moment. I had to respond. And I was going, wait a minute. You know, like with a big cigar, wait a minute. This seems to be absolutely everything I'm teaching. And I was teaching them as a performance skill. I am now doing the improv things as a life skill. And that's when I first started going, this stuff is just so powerful from a performing point of view and from a life point of view. And I found this relationship between yes and no so important for me getting over my anxiety was going, I need to start making decisions where I own my decision rather than make a decision and then live in the regret of it or make a decision that I say yes and I don't mean yes, or I say no and I don't mean no, or I'm in what I call a yes with a no in the back of my head. So you're just constantly oscillating between the yes and the no. And I found that so, so helpful. And so when I teach improvisation, the first class generally is about the word yes and the word no. And I just ask people to reflect on it, you know. And we're going to look at yes and no in a little bit more detail in a moment. But you say in your classes, the most difficult thing that I'm going to ask you to do today is to be yourself. Can you expand on that for me? Yeah, I mean, we play so many roles in our lives that then to ask a group of strangers to be with 12 other people and honestly answer questions about yourself and honestly reveal yourself rather than here's hilarious fun Pippa Evans who's always fun and never is ever sad or the person that we want to present. But if we're going to do work on ourselves, we have to be vulnerable. So how do we allow ourselves to really be ourselves, to really say what we want to say, to reveal our imagination actually is very hard. So this idea that I have of this follow your obvious, the reason we often don't say what is obvious to us is because we feel it's too obvious and people will think it's silly. But so often when people say what is obvious to them or what they are truly experiencing in the moment, someone else in the room will go, oh, I feel that. Oh, I know that. I hear that. And this obvious can be incredibly precious. In your book, you tell a story about market research into sandwiches. <laughs> so tell us about that. So I've done many, many jobs as a performer. This is what you do to make your money in between acting jobs. And I worked for a company that called, I think it was called Imagination Station or something like that. Companies would basically hire a group of very creative people to come up with ideas for their their things. And one of them was about sandwiches. They were trying to make new, cool, sexy sandwiches, which again, you're like, wow, this is a world I didn't know existed, but somebody's got to try and make sandwiches sexy again. And I said something along the lines of, 
I really remember like the sandwiches I had when I was a kid, you know, they're wrapped in cling film and there was sort of like so much love in them. And then someone else was like, oh, I, I like it when you got them in a brown paper bag, you know, and the people went a bit bonkers, really. The marketing people were like, oh, wow, this is amazing. So what you're saying is you don't want your sandwiches in a plastic triangle. What you want is them to remind you of your childhood. And so I don't know, everybody, if you've been in a Marks and Spencers or such, hashtag no uh, sponsorship, there are these sandwiches in brown paper bags and there are these little tea selections. And I can't claim that it was 100% my idea or our group's idea. But I like to think that uh, we were a part of that sandwich revolution because we were willing to follow our obvious. So don't be ashamed of saying actually what you're thinking. Yeah. Don't be ashamed of saying what you're thinking is really important. I will caveat that with is this the right space to put what I'm thinking in? Because I also talk in the book about there are, of course, sometimes when we've said what are obvious and it's not been respected. So there are reasons for us to protect our obvious as well. You know, if we feel like I'm in a space, I feel like the general vibe here is respect and interest and intrigue. I'm going to be bold and follow my obvious. If we feel like it's not a space where people are going to respect it, maybe hold it back a little bit until we, we feel that sense of it's going to be okay. So let's unpack yes and no, because you say that yes isn't a word, it's an attitude. Yes. So there's a great quote from Keith Johnston, who's one of the, call him like the godfather of UK improv. And he says, and I'm going to paraphrase it, there are people who say yes, and it leads them to adventure. And there are people who say no, and it leads them to safety. And what I love about that quote is it's not saying one is better than the other, because I think there's a lot of texts and films and things that's like, go into the world, say yes to everything. Bleh! To be honest, that's what leads to a lot of people's burnout and panic attacks. And madness. <laughs> Absolute madness. But I love that idea that yes leads to adventure because it's an opening word. So it is an attitude of opening yes, take me somewhere. Let's see what happens. I'm going to say yes to this date. I'm going to say yes to that holiday. I'm going to say yes to that new job. I'm going to say yes to whatever it is. And then when we're saying no, we're actually creating space. So that no is a, you can think of it as a barn door shutting and opening. And when I think of this door shutting, I used to think of no as a kind of, no, there is no fun anymore in this world rather boom. than exactly boom, end of good times. Whereas actually, if you think of it as a, like a barn door with lots of light, it's just shutting it. And now you're in this warm, safe barn. It's like actually this no creates space for me. So that's when I like to say no is a yes to yourself. And there's nothing wrong with a bit of safety and security. A hundred percent. Yeah. Again, I think so many people are pressured into being, you've got to have a crazy life. But actually, sometimes we just need to sit and be with a tree and relax. And you describe no as an old friend. Tell me about that. My old friend, no. I think we all have a, a difficult relationship with the word no. And I wonder also what the gender politics of that would be as well, that, you know, mm. to be a woman to say no is to claim power and to claim space for yourself. So often when I teach my courses again, a lot of the women say that they say yes all the time. And a lot of the men say they actually want to learn to say yes more. But that's only from my uh, classes, I will say. But this idea of saying no. And so that actually no can be a word that we wanted to say and we didn't say. And then we regret not saying it. So we might have some shame around the word no. Or we might have said no and it's been ignored. We might have this tricky relationship with the word no. But we need to kind of get back in touch with no and allow ourselves to rekindle that friendship. Because if we only have yes and we don't have no, then we don't have that balance that we're always looking for. And so when people, when you say no and you really mean it, it's such a great feeling, you know, when you don't suffer from FOMO. And uh, I'll tell you this, the fear of missing out. And then one day I was on the train. I was like, what about the joy of missing out? That's great. Okay, I'm going to start this hashtag, Jomo. You know, 12 people were like, wow, that's great. And then I looked it up and some guy had written a book called Jomo and it was a huge phenomenon, you know, seven, eight years ago. So I thought I'd invented Jomo, everyone, but I didn't. So there's a good example of following my obvious and then having to accept the reality that my obvious was someone else's obvious and they'd already made millions of pounds out of it. <laughs> oh, dear. But I love the idea of no being a person and thinking about your relationship with 
No. When did you meet No? How did you get on with No? There's a certain sort of curiosity about it to understand about No. Who can you say No to and who can't you say No to? What about your mother and the word No? I mean, there's a lot of interesting material there. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think the, the word there that stuck out for me was curiosity. You know, I have a whole chapter called Curiosity Didn't Kill the Cat, It Woke Her Up. And so I think curiosity is such an important thing because so often we meet these words with judgment rather than curiosity. And so if we can actually be curious with ourselves and say, oh, I wonder, actually, I do seem to struggle to say no, Ben so-and-so asked me for things, or I do seem to struggle to say no to jobs. You know, so as a performer, one of the no's I had to learn was to say no to jobs because you're freelance. You think you have to say yes to absolutely everything because the next thing could be the next big thing. But actually, A, it's often not. (laughs) And B, you're much better off doing two or three jobs really, really well than you are doing 15 absolutely exhausted because you're in one job thinking about the next job because you haven't had a chance to learn your lines. So learning to say no and getting rid of the joy of opportunity hoarding, as I believe it's now called. So one of my problems is that I rather like to be in control. Mm. In a sense, I'm in control on this podcast. You know, I ask the questions. Are you, Andrew, though? Really? Are you? Well, that's the problem. You know, it sort of runs away with me. But and I think we all are a little bit of control freaks. Sure. And I wonder if improvisation can teach us anything about how not to be a control freak and actually, I don't think I want to say go with the flow, but accept what actually is happening. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm going to say yes, it can. That was my offer to you. Wasn't it was a it? wonderful offer, Andrew, and I'm going to yes and it. So for me, the big thing is it taught me what I can and I can't control, which breaks down to I can control me, and that's about it. I can control what I offer back. I can control or work on. Maybe control might be the wrong word. I can work on uh, how I respond in the moment. I can work on my skills. What I can't control is what you're going to say next. I can't control what the audience is going to do. I can't control any of the external stuff, essentially. I cannot control the offer that's going to be made to me. So all I can do is be with what I am and then try and genuinely listen to you and respond to you rather than try and influence what you do so that it's within the box that I've created for you. And I think that happens a lot in relationships, in marriages. So we can't control our partner however much we would like to think that we can. And we can't control life. But can we have a say in the next chapter? In life in general? Yes. So the idea of improvisation is almost like you have to entirely go with the flow. And I'm just positing the idea that there might be somewhere between no control and just going with the flow. And I'm just wondering what you think. So I would say that's a misunderstanding of improvisation is go with the flow, simply because you're always working with the paradox of the star and the ensemble, as it were. So you're constantly co-creating, but you are bringing yourself into it, you know. So there's a great quote by, uh, I think it's an environmental scientist called Thomas Oppel, which is, everyone has influence, no one has control. And I love that as a saying, everyone has influence, no one has control, because you always have a chance to put something in. However, you won't be able to respond what happens next. So there's, yeah, there's a great improv game called What Happens Next? You know, so I pick up a book, what happens next? I open the book. What happens next? I flip the book pages. That's literally all you can do is step by step what happens next. And so when you're co-creating, so you might say, what happens first? I'm going to start a new job. What happens next? We're going to have to just approach that when it happens. If we're going step by step rather than what we're often doing is thinking of the end game. I want to be over there. I want to be in my retirement home in the Bahamas when I'm 70. Well, we can try and get there, but we might not get there how we thought we would. We might not get there at all. And can we be happy if we get completely over somewhere else? It doesn't look anything like that. If we know that we got there because we were doing step by step rather than I was so fixed on my idea of the Bahamas that by not getting there, I refuse to enjoy where I am. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. 
Now, one of the great advantages of uh, joining the supporters circle of The Meaningful Life is you can write in a letter to us and we have all sorts of other benefits at higher levels as well. If you want to find out more, go to my website, www.andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcasts. And as I say, you can write in a letter and here's one I've got to discuss with Pippa. I am fascinated by how often your guests talk about their life path. I would love to have some direction, but mostly I feel blocked and anxious about what the future holds. My marriage fell apart last year after my husband was unfaithful. We tried a couple of times to patch things up, but he went back to the other woman and I lost patience. Not certain what he's doing now. I'd like to say I don't care, but that would be lying. I find myself at 40 on my own with an okay job and a good circle of friends. I want a new relationship, but the thought of dating and dating apps just overwhelms me. How on earth would I even start? I wasn't that good at dating 15 years ago, and I doubt I would be any better now. And anyway, I imagine the cards are stacked against me. My husband had an affair with a much younger woman, so I have few illusions about men anymore. I don't want to grow old and alone or live with half a dozen cats, but I don't want to sit on a bar stool in a short dress making a fool of myself. I can hear the younger version of myself saying, you don't need a man to complete you. But when I try and think, what would complete me? I draw a great big blank. Where do I start? How do I find the courage to get out there again? I feel too bruised and battered. Right. So I think some improvisation skills might be necessary at this point. Which ones are coming to your mind, Pippa? Well, first, I'd just like to say, I'm sorry I had this experience and that you're going through this to your listener, mm. because it sounds really hard and it feels like there's still a lot of pain in this letter, actually. Mm. So the first thing I would say in improvisation is to talk about not fixing things. So what often happens in improvisation is someone presents a problem and we Im immediately try and fix it. So I don't want to grow old alone. Well, don't worry, I found, a, I found a man here. But actually it feels like there's some emotional stuff we need to work through before we can get to the point of do we want to be with a partner. That would be my first thing is try and allow yourself to work through these painful things that are going on. The fact that you say, I, I'd like to say I don't care, but that would be lying. To me, there's so much in that sentence of mm. not being um, not being at the point at which we can say goodbye to this relationship, as in it's it's still with us. You know, He is gone, but the relationship is still with you. So that mo taking the time to allow that to heal, really. Because actually you'll find once that is healed, and it may take some time, then you will be able to play what happens next or what happens first. Because again, I'm really drawn to the line when I try and think what would complete me, I draw a great big blank. I think if anyone tries to think, well, I wonder what would complete me? That's a huge question. So we can only do with, as you say, where do I start? So what happens first? Is it that you go and make sure you socialize with your friends lots? Is it that you join a new social group? club or group near you? Is it that you actually do something completely different? Pick a new hobby? Is it that you go and, I don't know, sit on a river bank every day? What, I don't know what it is, but you know, to think, to think of what is the first thing I might like to do? And then the other thing I would love to suggest is there's this very binary moment in this letter, which is I don't want to grow old and alone or live with a half a dozen cats. I also don't want to sit on a bar stool in a short dress, making a fool of myself. And it sounds like you think there's only these two versions of the woman you could become. And whereas, so let's play the game of who else is there? So if this is true, what else is true? So is there, there's another person, there's the, the, the woman who's vibrant in her own home and she's painted all the walls bright colors. There's the woman who chucked it all in and she's got a van and she's driving around the world. There's it's funny. The, I, I, I was thinking of that woman, the woman in the van driving around the world as well. Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Well, there you go. So, so play a game of that. Who else, who else could this person be? Because what you also have here from the pain, and this is a good example of a painful accept and build, actually, a painful accept and build is this has happened to my relationship. I thought I was going to be somewhere else. And look, here we are. So we have to accept where we are and build from there. So to be in that this moment and build, what, what, where could it go? What, what, um, what if, a what if moment? And I think if some of them are angry ones, yeah. that is okay. So, you know, somebody with a cauldron throwing in um, frog's legs and giggling. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have a massive hammer smashing walls in an old warehouse. Yeah. Let all of those ones come out. They haven't got to all just be positive no, ones. No, no. 
let's have the dark ones as well. Yeah, absolutely. What about the lady sits on a bar stool, you know, with makeup all down her face going, I told you we shouldn't have done any of this. You know, there's so many brilliant characters in the world. I, I rather like the one, the woman who's sitting on the bar stool with a gun in her purse. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Be playful with it. Be playful. What are, what are these different versions that might be? And, you know, you might start a big cat sanctuary rather than live with pussy cats. Yeah. I mean, the options are endless, really, aren't they? When you start thinking like this and we're actually having some fun. But some of the ones that you might be drawn to, like, for example, my evil, evil ones, might be just that you need to allow yourself to get all of that anger out a little bit because it's okay to be angry. Yeah, 100%. I think there's a great need for rage and to allow ourselves. Again, I think as women, we're often told to be nice and polite and just get on with it. All right, off we go. Oh, well, my husband left me and he was unfaithful. Never mind. <laughs> just stiff up a lip. It's like, no, go and scream into a big hill. Go and walk up a hill and scream for 20 minutes. That's what I do. Mm. And I'd also really recommend listening to the Tim Minchin song, If I Didn't Have You, I'd Have Somebody Else. It's a really life-affirming song, which came out of a conversation he had with his wife, where I believe he said to his wife something like, what do you think would have happened if you'd never met me? And she said, oh, I probably would have met someone else. <laughs> and I just <laughs> love the honesty of that, you know. <laughs> so yeah, if you, if you want a bit of uh, comedy to light in the moment I'd listen to that song. Excellent. That is a very different but absolutely beautiful answer. So thank you very much for that. One of the things that we haven't talked about that really interested me was that as well as having an improv career, you co-created something called the Sunday Assembly, a weekly church for people who don't believe in God. <laughs> Wow. What, what amazing segue in <laughs> to the other. It's often the thing that gets brought up at quite near the end of podcasts because it's like, oh, and also you do this, did this thing that was very different to everything else you do. I mean, I could quite happily have you back and we could talk about God for people who don't believe in him. That mm. sounds, or her or whatever, or they. So explain. <laughs> Well, so myself and a, com a fellow comedian called Sanderson Jones were once having a conversation on the way to a gig about how we felt it was sad that not believing God meant you couldn't go to church because we could see all the good stuff that churches do. Like having a local community, having a place to think about the bigger questions in life, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we said, well, what would happen if you tried to make church for people who don't believe in God? And we're like, oh, yeah, I have thought about that, actually. We've both been thinking about that. So we went, well, let's have a go. So we decided to have a go. What would it look like? So we had a speaker, you know, doing a talk about an interesting topic instead of a sermon. We had a poet instead of a reading. We sang pop songs instead of hymns. And we would... And we'd have a moment of silence, a moment of reflection where everybody would sit together and reflect on their week, their day, whatever it was, was on their mind. Uh, and we did the first one in 2013 and we put out, I think, 40 chairs and 200 people turned up. Wow. From all sorts of different walks of life as well, which was very shocking actually for us because we were like, oh, so normally as a performer, when you put on a show, as it were, the people who come are your friends, your parents, you know, people who feel obliged to come. And actually <laughs> none of them were there. It was all people we didn't recognize pretty much. So it was a real moment of, oh, we seem to have stumbled upon something maybe more powerful than we thought it was. So we went from there and, and we had people from all over the world contacting us, wanting to start their own Sunday assembly. Uh, and it really sort of spoke to this moment of there are a lot of lonely people out there. And there are also a lot of people who are in a spiritual, I think quagmire might be the right word or spiritual seeking where they just, they're spiritually empty. Well, yeah. However, unable to articulate what that is or what that means. So we had people come and go, actually, what Sunday Assembly's done is it made me realise I want to go back to church. So it, it helped some people sort out where their spirituality was. And it became very much a place for people who hadn't met friends in London. You know, I speak from London because that's the one that I, I ran. But at one point we had sort of 60 or 70 around the world. 
and people would come and they would find people because we had this motto, which was live better, help often, wonder more. So it really spoke to people who were finding that they wanted more purpose in their life than just earn the money, you know, go up the ladder, buy a house, have a family, you are done. And does it still exist? So it does still exist. I haven't worked for Sunday Assembly for three years or three or four years. I left once it got to a point where I really felt that actually we had to leave as co-founders for it to be what it was. Again, come back to improv, what it was rather than what we thought it should be. Um, it needed to, to live in, in its own moment. But it has declined a lot because one of the challenges of it was funding. We couldn't get the money to hire people to run it constantly. So one of the bonuses churches have, of course, is having buildings. Uh, so very practical reasons why it didn't work. And it's very hard for people to support something financially that you can't see what it's doing. But also perhaps one of the things Sunday Assembly wasn't quite able to do was to satisfy that spiritual question, because actually we as two comedians were unable to host that question because we were still searching for that ourselves. So I think what it became is a really brilliant place to find people who are on a similar path to you. So this podcast is called The Meaningful Life. So we're sort of coming right to the central question. You're my witness on The Meaningful Life. What makes your life meaningful? Being in relation with others and not shying away from that, to really be in community and be an active citizen. So to really feel like I'm present rather than I am planning or plotting, and to know that there are other people in this world other than me. That's an important one, isn't it? Yeah. One of the most profound things I ever heard, I went to see a <laughs> Barbara Dixon live, and Barbara Dixon did a Q&A at the end. And I asked her what made her feel happy, because she talked about having stage anxiety. And I said, so if the place you felt the most unhappy was when she was doing Blood Brothers on stage. She got really bad stage anxiety. I said, where's the place that makes you happiest? And she said, when I'm on the islands of Scotland on the beach, and it reminds me of the tiny grain of sand that I am. Wow. And I thought, that's it. I love it. I love it. And again, I think if I come back to my improv, is improv reminds you that you have a place and a purpose, but you are also a tiny grain of sand. And how are you doing with the spiritual question? Well, I still struggle with the word God, actually, but I've been really inspired recently by Rupert Spira. I don't know if you're aware of his work in the non-dual sense. And this non-duality, idea... Non-duality. Yeah. yeah. He speaks very simply about this idea of we are all one connected consciousness. And I find so much truth in that for me. When I feel best, when I feel completely connected to the world, I often use the phrase, I to the we, to the them, to the us. I to the we, to the them, to the us. And that's again from improvisation. I bring myself, we connect together. There's those people over there, but actually we are one. And so the minute I feel connected to myself, to the other people around me, to the trees, to the world, I feel like I'm a part of the world and I'm here. When I feel the least spiritually connected to the world is when I am in the world of, what am I doing? I'm such a loser. Everything's the worst. I should give everything up. I should retrain. And I'm just in the, I should, I should, I should. And I'm trying to plan something in a world that we have seen, we have literally lived through, we cannot control. It is so true. And I think that can make you panic. But um, the whole idea of infization and the idea that actually you can co-create and when two people get together or more than two people get together, there is a certain sort of magic comes up is a very reassuring sort of kind of idea. So thank you for making the connection between improvisation and life skills, because I think they are really important to make. Now, this unfortunately is the point where most people are going to say goodbye to Pippa. But if you are a member of our supporters circle, the conversation continues. And here's details about how to find out more. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. 
visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Collick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.